3. Anthropology The anthropology he went to, moreover, was ostensibly religious but actually naturalistic, namely William Robertson Smith's 1846 to 1894, whose works in particular, The Religion of the Semites, are basic to an understanding both of the nature and meaning of modernism in the churches and of Freudianism as a psychology. The basic influence of William Robertson Smith on modernism and Freudianism is also behind their increasingly closer ties and common allegiances. In Totem and Taboo, 1913, Freud clearly and openly stated these premises. In every culture, he pointed out the holy or sacred, the taboo, has a double meaning. Quote, on the one hand it means to us sacred, consecrated, but on the other hand it means uncanny, dangerous, forbidden and unclean. End quote. An ambivalence of emotions is clearly revealed and a like ambivalence is basic to conscience. Conscience, when violated, leads to strong guilt feelings. But conscience is violated by very strong feelings also. Quote, Psychoanalysis here confirms what the pious were wont to say, that we are all miserable sinners. End quote. But we are not sinners against God, for there is no God for Freud. Freud turned then to the dark sins that strike men with horror and yet are so deeply written into man's primitive past. Incest, parasite and cannibalism. To summarise his thesis briefly, in the primitive society or primal horde, the violent primal father drove out the sons and claimed exclusive sexual possession of the mother and the daughters. This Oedipus complex is, quote, the origin of morality in each of us, end quote. Quote, this violent primal father has surely been the envied and feared model for each of the brothers, end quote. He was power and the father image incarnate. Finally, the rebellious sons banded, killed and ate the father and possessed the mother and the sisters. They hated the father who stood so powerfully in the way of their sexual demands and their desire for power, but they also loved and admired him. After they had satisfied their hate by his removal and carried out their wish for identification with him, the suppressed tender impulses had to assert themselves. This took place in the form of remorse. A sense of guilt was formed which coincided here with the remorse generally felt. The dead now became stronger than the living had been, even as we observe it today in the destinies of men. What the father's presence had formerly prevented, they themselves now prohibited in the psychic situation of, quote, subsequent obedience, end quote, which we know so well from psychoanalysis. They undid their deed by declaring that the killing of the father substitute, the totem, was not allowed, and renounced the fruits of their deed by denying themselves the liberated women. Thus they created two fundamental taboos of totemism out of the sense of guilt of the son, and for this very reason, these had to correspond with the two repressed wishes of the Oedipus complex. Whoever disobeyed became guilty of the two only crimes which troubled primitive society. The two taboos of totemism with which the morality of man begins are psychologically not of equal value. One of them, the sparing of the totem animal, rests entirely upon emotional motives. The father had been removed and nothing in reality could make up for this. But the other, the incest prohibition, had, besides a strong practical foundation. Sexual need does not unite men, it separates them. Though the brothers had joined forces in order to overcome the father, each was the other's rival among the women. Each one wanted to have them all to himself like the father, and in the fight of each against the other, the new organisation would have perished for there was no longer anyone stronger than all the rest who could have successfully assumed the role of the father. Thus there was nothing left for the brothers, if they wanted to live together, but to erect the incest prohibition, perhaps after many difficult experiences, through which they all equally renounced the women whom they desired, and on account of whom they had removed the father in the first place. Thus they see of the organisation which had made them strong and which could be based upon the homosexual feelings and activities which probably manifested themselves among them during the time of their banishment. 
Perhaps this situation also formed the germ of the institution of the mother right discovered by Bachoven, which was then abrogated by the patriarchal family arrangements. After Herodotus, Freud saw gods as created in man's image, of the father in particular, so that, quote, God at bottom is nothing but an exalted father, end quote. In Christianity, this myth is carried a step further. The son is now killed to make expiation for the murder of the father, and, quote, with this sacrifice, there follows the complete renunciation of women, for whose sake mankind rebelled against the father, end quote. The appeasing son becomes like the father a god, so that, quote, the religion of the son succeeds the religion of the father, end quote. With Goethe, Freud repeats, quote, in the beginning was the deed, end quote. The answer would appear to be simple. Knowing now that the gods are non-existent, why should not then man, after the sad's counsel, commit incest, parasite and cannibalism to his heart's content and be truly, quote-unquote, free? Certainly, many followers of Freud in the world of art and elsewhere held that a thoroughgoing primitivism was the answer. Not so Freud, as we shall see. As is already apparent from his depiction of the primal horde, even so-called primitive man had powerful, suppressed impulses, and living totally outside any civil law was himself an omnipotent acting law, so that his answer to his crime was to enforce the law with inexorable force. If primitive man was so firmly bound by inner law, how can modern man, in whom it has far deeper roots, hope to escape it? Freud doubted that he could, and here we come to an important distinction. Freud offered no solution to the problem, only an understanding of it. The neo-Freudians have insisted that there is an answer, and it is at this point that many admirers as well as critics of Freud go astray. Trilling does not seem to be aware of the thrust of Freud. Nattenberg has attacked Freud for conducting psychoanalysis as research rather than therapy and cites Freud as admitting therapeutic failure. For Nattenberg, the essence of the charge against the Freudians is that they, quote, believe neuroses are incurable, end quote. The charge falls flat because it only proves Freud's contention namely that psychoanalysis cannot indulge in wishful thinking and fall victim to, quote, the lie of salvation, end quote, but must bear witness to truth as a scientific discipline, even if the witness is a counsel of despair. The problem is this. Is Freud's conclusion based on a correct analysis of the facts, or is it based on a faulty anthropology? At this point, as Harry K. Wells has pointed out in a very able analysis, comparative anthropology has been attacking Freud's foundations at six key points, all of which Freud derived from, quote, the spurious anthropological doctrines of British so-called evolutionary anthropology, especially the theories of Robertson Smith, end quote. The six fundamental concepts of Freud now attacked by comparative anthropology are one, quote, the primal horde myth on which Freud based his theories of the id and of the superego and hence of society, end quote. Two, the doctrine of the phylogenetic memories, end quote, according to which remote primitive experiences, quote, become biologically hereditary memories, end quote, of all persons. Three, quote, the concept of biologically innate infantile sexual phases through which every child must pass between birth and age of five or six, end quote, these being centred around the erotogenic zones, the mouth with its oral cannibalistic drives, the anus with, quote, its anal sadistic aggressive drives, and the primary sexual organs and their genital drives, end quote. Two, quote, the biologically predetermined Oedipus complex, end quote. Five, quote, a primordial language composed of archaic symbols in the form of imagery, end quote, held to be a biologically hereditary feature of human nature and appearing in dreams, myths and folklore. And six, quote, a biologically inherited racial unconscious, the repository of all the phylogenetic memories, infantile sexual phases, and Oedipus tribes and taboos against them, as well as of the primordial symbolic language, end quote. 
The collapse of Freud's anthropology has been responsible for much of Freudian revisionism. But Freud was in many respects wiser than his critics, and in adopting the anthropological basis he did, was not unaware of its controversial character. Throughout his career, as that anthropology came under increasing fire, Freud made no attempt to alter it. Instead, he developed it more intensively in the face of criticism. Freud's reason for this was a simple one. He was an evolutionary scientist, and he recognised that evolution was fundamental to his perspective. An evolution required somewhere an act of faith, or else it had to assume continuous miracles to provide the machinery or mechanism of evolutionary faith. Freud accordingly held that the only way out of the evolutionary impasse was to follow Lamarck. And, as Jones notes, quote, he adhered throughout his life, end quote, to the Lamarckian belief.